Good morning, church. It's great to see you today. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the lay, uh, lay worship leaders here at Faith United Methodist Church today. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us on this kind of ra uh, rainy and dreary morning, but every day is a good day to worship God. Amen? Yeah. Uh, today is um, the second Sunday of Advent. And I think for people outside the church, Advent is a religious term for uh, Christmas shopping season, uh, but it's not. In reality, Advent is a season of waiting and hope and expectation. It's the time when we remind ourselves that Jesus is coming and he is on his way. So it's time for us to prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves to greet him and receive him. Our scripture reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Jim Sandberg. I'm an occasional lay worship leader, an occasional preacher, and starting November 1st, I have become the director of congregational care. And I consider it a great privilege and an honor to be serving among you and to be working with Pastor Caleb. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collectible hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and redeemer. 
Amen. You might not know this about me, but I'm something of a gym rat. I always feel better after I work out. I can be having the worst day in the world. I can feel lousy, but if I make it to the gym, I always feel better after I work out. Now, I won't bore you with the details of my workout. I mean, I can tell you that um, endorphins and sweat are incredibly therapeutic, but I won't bore you with how I get to that point. However, you might find this to be a bit interesting. At the gym I attend, there is a nice-sized TV in the locker room. There is always three or four guys sitting around the TV, watching a ball game, listening to network news, and kibitzing about one thing or another. Last week, I walked into the locker room. At the same time, an older gentleman stood up, somewhat older than me. He had the remote in his hand, clicked off the TV, flipped the remote down, turned and walked away with a look of disgust on his face. And of course, one of the guys sitting there said, what are you doing, man? Why'd you turn the TV off? Obviously, they'd been watching something political because this man stopped, turned around, and said, I've had it with those politicians in Washington. I've had it. The world is a hot mess, and they keep blaming one another. The Republicans blame the Democrats. The Democrats blame the Republicans. They can't get together to work on the simplest of things, let alone significant things. I've given up hope. I've given up hope, he said, that politicians will ever be able to come together and get anything significantly done. No hope. No hope is a dangerous thing. To be without hope is a very, very dangerous thing. You have to have hope in order to care. You have to have hope in order to act. Hope, as I understand it, arises from the conviction that someone or something can make a difference. I well recall a man I met while serving the church out in DeKalb. He wasn't a member of the congregation, but he came to worship with us every now and again, and every now and again he brought his family with him. He and his family had fallen on hard times, very difficult times. His wife had some serious health issues. He had lost his job and had struggled to find a new job. Some in the church decided to take this man on as a project and to help him, to reach out to him, help him find a job. The DeKalb Church, like, like Faith, has a big heart. Someone bought him a new set of clothes. Has to look nice when he goes looking for a job. A couple of the gentlemen in the congregation met with him, talked with him about his job interests, where he'd like to work, what, what is it that he really likes to do. They gave him solid leads, they, they gave him nice references, and they sent him out, and he went looking for a job. Still couldn't find one. I sat with him in my study on a cold, dreary December day as he shared with me all of his struggles. He was depressed and dejected and discouraged, and my heart went out to him. He said to me, you know, Pastor, maybe it's that I've had so many doors slammed in my face, I just can't bear to knock on another door. I can't take any more rejection. I've been knocked down so many times, I just can't get up again and I've lost hope I've lost hope that I will ever ever find a job again I tell you a chill a chill went down my spine it is 
a frightening thing to be in the presence of a fellow human being without hope. In fact, without hope, there's not much of a human being. It's hard to believe that the James Cameron movie, the mega hit, the Titanic, was released in December 24 years ago. 24 years ago, my goodness. And I finally got around to seeing it earlier this past month. And that's only because my son-in-law had made me an additional user on his HBO Max account. And now I have access to all of these movies that I've missed over the years. Having finally watched this movie, The Titanic, I get it. I understand why it was such a big hit. I remember a young girl in my confirmation class, she said, Oh, Pastor, you need to see The Titanic. I've already seen it ten times. I'm not sure why anybody would want to see it ten times. But I can see why it was a hit. But something about the ending, something about the ending of that movie was, was less. It was, well, it was, just, it was just less. It was less. I can close my eyes even now and, and see all those dead, frozen bodies floating in the water in the ocean with their life jackets still on. And I don't think I'll ever forget that image of those two gigantic propellers rising above the water as the Titanic gives one last heave before sinking, going under and disappearing from our view. The movie then just seemed to end. What was I to do with all that death? What was I to do with all that annihilation? An old woman clutching a few photographs and a piece of jewelry, that's it? That's all I get? Movies like the Titanic do a realistic job depicting the reality of death and sweeping annihilation but they inevitably come up short when it comes to hope. Maybe, maybe that has to do with what the good people of Hollywood really believe. I mean, what do you say to death? What do you say to defeat and despair when you really don't believe in a God who moves, acts, intervenes, and responds to our despair? Where's hope? Where is hope if it's something the world, if it's something that you and I must create and manufacture for ourselves? Today's scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah ecstatically speaks of a time when a sprout shall come out of the stump of Jesse. As he, as he prophesizes, as Isaiah prophesizes about, about a new beginning for, for Israel, out of an old dead stump, new life sprouts. You heard the text. It's a powerful text, a beautiful text. Metaphor is piled on top of metaphor as the prophet struggles to give language to this newness that shall break forth. prophet envisions a whole new world. Same, but different from the world as we experience it, as we know it. Later, in chapter 35, with some of the most breathtaking poetry in all of Scripture, Isaiah offers a stunning description of the desert bursting forth into bloom coming of God. Everything, my friends, hope and everything else hinges upon the prophet's bold proclamation that God is with us. 
Does it surprise you that both of these passages originated during one of Israel's darkest hours? Israel had been carried off into exile. All their cities, including beloved Jerusalem, had been destroyed. They were captives. They were prisoners in a strange land. And here at the darkest hour, God's prophet proclaimed extravagant hope. God hears. God draws near. God comes to save us. Where lies our hope? this Advent? Where is our hope this year, 2021? Does our hope lie in the politicians in Washington, D.C.? Or in Springfield, Illinois? There are a lot of people, a lot of people like that gentleman at my gym who's had it. He's had it with business as usual in the world of politics. Many people have lost faith in the government's ability to make a difference, a real difference in their lives, a difference in the lives of others. Not to worry. There's always technology. Through research and human inventiveness, we'll walk into a brighter future. It was the good people of GE who said, we bring good things to life. I think that accurately sums up our faith in technology. Thanks to our technological know-how, we just assume that the world, we just assume that our lives will get better and better and better. How's that working for us? Have we watched the world get better and better? If we lose faith in our technological wizardry, if we lose faith in good old-fashioned American know-how, what hope is there for us? What hope do any of us really have? I heard someone say, failed gods lead to dashed hopes. Failed gods lead to dashed hopes. Is that where we find ourselves today? Is that where we're at in the valley of dashed hopes? More than a few of you are old enough to remember that iconic credit card commercial. You've got the whole world in your hands. MasterCard. Master the possibilities. MasterCard. If that's true, then sad to say we are without hope. If you and I have the whole world in our hands, if everything is left up to you and me, well, I'm telling you, we are in for some serious trouble. Not surprisingly, Ours is a time of pervasive cynicism. People don't trust the government. People don't trust the media. People don't trust the police. They don't trust the courts. They don't trust the schools. They don't trust big pharma. They don't trust big business. Everywhere you turn, there is pervasive cynicism and grievous mistrust. It's also a time of widespread depression. I think it was Pastor Caleb who said that shopping is now America's number one hobby. Shopping, number one hobby. Shopping, favorite American pastime. And I always thought it was baseball. My point is, a lot of people, a lot of people out there shop to feel better, to feel better about life, to feel better about themselves. In other words, they're trying to buy their way out of their funk. 
If I only get this, if I only get that, if I only have that, I'm going to feel better. So I keep buying just for fun. I checked out the 101 best Christmas gifts that will be on everybody's wish list. All I can say is that you would have to feel sorry for someone whose life would really be made worth living by getting the Keurig K Supreme Smart Choice Coffee Maker. By the way, people aren't just buying to break out of their chronic malaise. They're turning to drugs. Some legal, some not. Drug abuse, drug addiction is at an all-time high in this country. Addiction, in part, has to do with numbing one's feelings. Better to be high. Better to be loaded than to be overwhelmed with feelings of hopelessness. What's it say about the great land of Lincoln? What's it say about Illinois' overall emotional health and well-being that from January to March in 2021, Illinois generated $86,537,000 in adult use marijuana tax revenue. What's that say about us? Here in Advent, I call that a lack of hope. Nor does it help that for many, God has become an empathetic, but mostly absent in an active and inactive deity who cares but chooses not to act or intervene in human affairs. If that's what we believe about God, that, that God is somewhere out there but doesn't bother with us, no wonder there's hopelessness. If everything is left up to us, what hope does the world, do any of us really have? Today's scripture, both the reading from Isaiah 11 and the reference to Isaiah 35, comes from one of the most hopeless times in Israel's long history. Israel was in exile. And for a people in exile, the prophet piles up image upon image upon image to show a creation restored, healed, redeemed because, because God is with us. Out of an old dead stump comes new life. Isaiah pictures a day of, of new beginnings. The dry, arid desert bursts forth into a lush green. Animals that have lived tooth, nail, and claw in conflict with one another shall lie together in peace and in harmony. Injustice, all the injustices out there shall long last be put down. The broken, the marginalized will no longer be broken and marginalized. God's reign will be all-encompassing. The world shall be as it was when God first imagined it. Faith, says theologian James Whitehead, is the enduring ability to imagine life in a certain way. That bears repeating. Faith is the enduring ability to imagine life in a certain way. I wonder... I wonder if Whitehead learned that from reading the book of Isaiah. You see, it takes a great deal of faith. It takes an incredible amount of faith in a, in a world of human brokenness, awash in the darkness of cynicism, depression, and despair to proclaim the presence and reality of God. 
takes a great deal of hope to be able to be honest about our own exile. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what else to call living in the midst of a global pandemic that just doesn't want to go away, but exile. So, we gather in Advent. We gather on a wet, relatively gloomy day and sing hymns of honest yearning. We sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We can be honest about the darkness. We can be honest about our failed efforts because we have an honest hope. We can admit, we can honestly admit to one another that we need a future, a future not solely of our own making, a future not solely of our own manufacturing and creating. There was a season in my life when I found myself in exile. I was in deep, dark exile. I was a captive to sin. I don't know how much you really know about sin. Sin, like a black hole, can swallow up your heart and your soul enveloped by such an all-pervasive darkness, I lost both the will and the, and the desire to break away from my sin. The darkness had become my life. But God did. God did what I could never do for myself. God chose and understand, this was God's idea, not my idea, God's idea. God chose to deliver me from the darkness of my sin. And I'm here today, I'm standing before you at the front of the church, not because of anything I did, but because of what God has done for me. The people who say, we have this absent and inactive deity, this, this God who cares but, but chooses not to intervene in human affairs. I say that's nonsense. And I say that's nonsense because God has come to me and changed and transformed my life. God's idea, not mine. If my future, if my future was all up to me, I'd still be in exile. I'd still be a captive to my sin. My friends, we can be honest. We can all be honest and tell the truth about our condition because we believe that God has made our situation, God has made our condition His we believe in a God who longs to be near us. We believe in a God who comes to us. And we believe in a God who comes to save us. So on this second Sunday of Advent, I proclaim to you, fear not. Despair not. Our God reigns. Our God comes to us. Emmanuel, God with us. Therefore, we have hope. And this is a real and true and lasting hope. It's not one that we make up. It's a hope that God gives us and plants deep within us. And so in this season of Advent, we wait for hope. Not our hope, but God's hope. Let's pray. Gracious God, in heaven above, we thank you for the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Oh, you have given us so many good gifts, but few gifts to us are as important as the gift of hope. It is hope in your goodness that enables us to keep going when life is difficult. 
It is hope that preserves our patience when all seems lost because your love for us is not only caring and compassionate but also active and resourceful. We have hope. You keep coming to us, keep reaching out to us, keep making a way for us when it seems as if there is no way. With heartfelt thanks, we praise you for the one whose birth we will soon celebrate, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is our one true and enduring hope. And it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. It's interesting preaching the same sermon three times. I've preached it the second time, and I'll preach it again at 11. But yesterday after I preached it, a really sweet lady came up to me um, in the narthex and said, What happened to that man in DeKalb? I worried about him all through the service. He did, he did get a job, but he had to wait. And that's a good reminder for all of us. And, and in hope, we have to wait. It's not instant always, but we can trust that God will act in God's time. And we can believe that. And now I invite you to turn to someone sitting nearby, a friend, a neighbor, someone, and tell them, God loves you and so do I. Receive the benediction. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.